All right, hello and welcome everyone to today's seminar. Uh, today I'm happy to be introducing Dr. Michael Hardinger. Mike is a research scientist at the Space Science Institute and his studies include ultra low frequency waves and other phenomena related to solar wind magnetism or ionosphere coupling. Currently, he is managing a network of magnetometers in Antarctica, which he uses as part of his research, and in particular to study north-south hemisphere symmetries in the ionosphere. Since 2019, Mike has also been the chair of the US Ground Magnetometer Advisory Board, a community-driven effort to advance ground-based magnetometer-related research and operations. Today, Mike will be discussing the Antarctic Array, as well as exploring north-south hemisphere symmetries through the expanded Arctic Antarctic instrument networks. If you'd like to take it away, Mike. Sure. Um, thanks a lot, Kyle, for the introduction and, and thanks for having me uh, on the seminar series here. It's a pleasure to talk to everyone um, about this stuff. Um, so like Kyle said, I'll, I'll be talking about how we're using Antarctic measurements to explore uh, North-South Hemisphere Asymmetries in conjunction with our colleagues, colleagues operating um, instruments in the, the Northern Hemisphere. Before I get started, I just want to acknowledge many collaborators uh, at Virginia Tech, UCLA, NGIT, UNH, um, and then internationally at the Technical University of Denmark, British Antarctic Survey, and the Polar Research Institute of China. Um, and there's just a ton of people involved in this project, so uh, and a ton of people did a lot of amazing work, which I'll be going over uh, today. So, um, so thanks to everyone. Also, um, I just want to acknowledge support from the National Science Foundation who supported uh, um, multiple projects related to this work. Um, and just the, a quick description of the pictures you're seeing here. Um, the middle is uh, the deployment of one of our uh, autonomous platforms in Antarctica. Uh, I'll get into that a little bit later on. And on the left and the right are pictures taken in, uh, on the left, West Antarctica, and on the right near McMurdo Station during the 2021 December Antarctic eclipse. And I'll get into a little bit about what's going on uh, in those figures later on in the talk. Now let's go on. So most of what I'll be talking about today has to do with uh, mesoscale current systems uh, and waves. Um, these are current systems that have spatial scales of a couple hundred kilometers or hundreds of kilometers in the ionosphere. And they're driven by a variety of transient phenomena, uh, both on the day side and the night side. Uh, this is one example um, uh, in this cartoon from Cybeck 1990, where you can see pressure disturbances um, on the upstream uh, boundary or day side boundary create ripples on the magnetopause, which in turn create vortical motion in the magnetosphere and field line currents that you then couple uh, into ionosphere currents when they close in the ionosphere. And there's a, a number of other examples of how you can get these kinds of uh, mesoscale current systems. And it turns out that these are really important uh, for global energy transfer, um, and use for ionosphere coupling processes, and they're a big topic of discussion, uh, both in the magnetosphere and ionosphere research communities right now, uh, in part because of their space weather impacts. For example, they've been linked to geomagnetically induced currents and ionosphere thermosphere heating. So we definitely want to understand these current systems and their spatial and temporal evolution. And one of the ways we do that is via remote sensing techniques. Uh, so uh, we all uh, know that you can remote sense uh, these with uh, all sky imagers, and that's a, a huge um, uh, area that, that really works well. Um, but we also can remote sense them with um, ground-based magnetometer observations. And um, the ground-based magnetometers will give you a sense of the um, ionosphere current systems, and sometimes also the magnetosphere current systems related to these things. One thing you have to take account for though, when you use ground-based magnetometers to remote sense these things is that the ionosphere really heavily modifies the currents, uh, sometimes in counterintuitive ways. One example of that is uh, Fukushima's theorem, which tells us that only the ionosphere call current is observed on the ground, uh, or that's all, all that you're remote sensing. Now that only is true in particular conditions. And so this is, this is basically a, a, a figure that shows you what's going on um, when you have just like one field line current coming down from the magnetosphere into the ionosphere, spreading out uh, and closing via Pedersen currents. It turns out that the field line current and the Pedersen currents exactly cancel in terms of when you look at their magnetic signature on the ground. But the Hall current, which is the circles here, is something that you actually can observe. This is only true in a spatially uniform ionosphere, and there's a couple other assumptions involved here. But um, basically, um, it works pretty well a lot of the time in terms of trying to understand what we're seeing on the ground. 
Um, and that one example of that in terms of um, the mesoscale current systems in particular related to the, the figure I showed on the last slide from the pressure disturbances, when you have um, just a, you know, an isolated field line current or set of field line currents, uh, when you remote sense them on the ground, uh, if you have a two-dimensional network, you will actually see something that looks a lot like the Hall current pattern you'd expect uh, from this, this simple figure here. And one example of that is from uh, Fris Christensen and all 1988, uh, who coined the term of a tra traveling convection vortex. And so what they showed is that when you have a one-dimensional north-south network of magnetometers, each one of these dots is a magnetometer, I think on the west coast of Greenland. And uh, what they saw over time, if you look at the magnetic deflection, I think they just rotated it by 90 degrees to give you a, a sense of the Hall current. Basically, this is the magnetic deflection as a function of latitude over time. And what's happening is uh, something like this field line current is being swept across uh, this one dimensional network. And it traces out these, this vertical pattern that's exactly a counterpart of this kind of signal coming in from the magnetosphere, these field line currents. And so this is, this is one example of how we've used ground-based magnetometers to really get a sense of the two dimensional structure of these, um, these mesoscale current systems and get a handle on their spatial and temporal evolution. The great thing about magnetometers is that they collect data all the time, um, both on the day side and that side. So you can get a lot of information about current systems in all kinds of locations. Okay, so although ground-based magnetometers are great for remote sensing, um, we really need to take account for the way that, um, you know, when we don't have that simple case of the spatial uniform ionosphere and we have you know, multiple spatial scales uh, in the ionosphere and magnetosphere, what happens? How do we observe them on the ground? So it's still a very active area of research. Even though we've had ground-based magnetometer observations for more than 100 years, um, you know, maybe even 200 years, depending on plus, depending on how you define a ground-based magnetometer observation, um, we still um, are, are working on trying to understand how different phenomena happening in the magnetosphere, the ionosphere, and the ground affect the signal that you actually observe. So it turns out that there are multiple spatial and temporal scales in, in these different regions, and they all can contribute to the signal you observe. You know, I mentioned earlier Fukushima's theorem. Well, that really only works in a spatially uniform ionosphere. When you have a, two slabs, this is, these gray areas are supposed to depict um, different regions of the ionosphere with different conductance. When you have the, a gradient in the ionosphere conductance, for example, Fukushima's theorem breaks down and you can see um, contributions from the Pedersen and the field line current. And there's some, some great work on that, uh, you know, going back many decades, looking at different, different configurations where that happens. You can also get um, contributions from the ground conductance. Um, and, you know, oftentimes uh, we all assume that the ground is a perfect insulator when we're um, uh, interpreting ground-based magnetometer observations. That's definitely not true. Um, there are ground, there are induced currents in the ground that create signals that you actually pick up with ground-based magnetometers. And it gets even more complex when there's um, uh, uh, basically inhomogeneities in the ground conductance. And so it's still an active area of research unraveling um, you know, all the different spatial and temporal scales in these different regions. But it's something that we're getting more and more information about as we look at smaller and smaller spatial scales with more and more uh, closely spaced magnetometer data. And I'll talk a bit more about this in the end of the talk when I get into the um, efforts of the wider ground-based magnetometer community. I also want to give credit to Michelle Salzano and I, Media Labadee, who made this cartoon, adapting uh, some, some uh, work from Jen Gannon in 2016. And uh, I'll talk a bit more about you know, the effort that led up to this cartoon and other um, community efforts uh, at the end. Okay, so that's a, that's you know a bit about ground-based uh, magnetometer observations in general and how they're useful for um, understanding the spatial and temporal variations related to meso mesoscale current systems. But why do we need north-south hemisphere comparisons? Why do we need observations of both hemispheres? Um, it turns out that if you look at both ends of a magnetic field line, you rarely see the same thing. If you're looking at, for example, rural forms, this is comparing a location in Iceland to Showa Station in Antarctica. You rarely see also the same um, ionosphere current systems. Uh, for example, there are asymmetries in ionosphere conductance that lead to differences in ionosphere current systems depending on what, uh, what season you're in. And um, these asymmetries play a big role in both local and global dynamics. We've seen this in many different studies looking at how, for example, asymmetries in ionosphere conductance during solstice uh, play a role in terms of the types of global current systems and convection patterns you'll get. Um, so we know that we need observations of both hemispheres to understand 
all kinds of phenomena, um, including mesoscale current systems. But it turns out we have a northern hemisphere observation bias. So um, you really need observations in Antarctica if you want to look at the high latitude um, uh, mesoscale current systems, things like traveling convection vortices and related to pressure disturbances and also transient night side disturbances. And if you look at the high latitude regions, there's only a couple of locations on Earth where you can remote sense these things in both hemispheres from the ground. So what this 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 is a, a figure from uh, adapted from Lanzarote 1987, where they basically took the coastline of Antarctica and they used, I believe, uh, uh, probably the IGRF model or similar to trace the coastline to the northern hemisphere. And when you do that, you see that basically there's only a few locations in the northern hemisphere. Eastern Canada, Greenland, Svalbard, and Iceland, where you can do these kinds of north-south hemisphere comparisons. And so we've, we, we pay a lot of attention uh, for this work to these regions, and we work closely with um, collaborators that operate systems in these regions of the northern hemisphere. Uh, and we also think carefully about where we're deploying observations in Antarctica so that we can do north-south hemisphere comparisons. Um, and that's um, a bit more about what I'll, I'll uh, a segue into what I'll be talking about in the next couple of slides. So, um, but before I show you something about our systems, I want to give you an idea of what happens when we have these big gaps in the southern hemisphere measurements in terms of looking at ground-based um, observations of mesoscale current systems. So we do have observations in, in Antarctica, and we have had observations in Antarctica for a long time. Um, but yeah, and we can look at all kinds of stuff with those observations, uh, large scale current systems, waves, et cetera. But um, when you start trying to push down to the mesoscales of a few hundred kilometers, it gets really hard to do north south hemisphere comparisons. And this Mur et al. 2002 study gives you an idea of, of, of what that means. Um, what they've done here is you're looking at sort of magnetic latitude and longitude on this grid. And each green dot is a magnetometer location in the, nor in the northern hemisphere spread across uh, Canada and Greenland, and maybe even out, out to Svalbard, I'm not sure. But the um, basically, you have enough of these green dots that you can make a grid uh, and sort of use a technique to fill in the gaps in between the green dots to see what types of um, magnetic and ionospheric uh, perturbations you're getting and, and get a sense of the kind of vortical motion. If you can see these, these little vectors have this kind of vortex motion uh, in the Northern Hemisphere. But then uh, if you look at the red dots, these are the observations we have in Antarctica. And in this case, there was only five. And so you can't, can't really see, and they're, and they're not really co-located either with the area of dense observations that we had in this particular event in the, in the Northern Hemisphere. So you can do conjugate comparisons, but you don't have the ability to fill in the gaps and look at what's going on in both hemispheres simultaneously at, at, at kind of multiple locations and, and get a sense of the, the smaller scale uh, structures. And so we really want to add more red dots to this map uh, to be able to see um, the mesoscale current systems, how they evolve spatially and temporally at the same time. So um, I'm going to talk a bit about the Autonomous Adaptive Low Power Instrument Platform, which is part of the Penguin uh, Consortium. Um, but I'm also going to mention other systems that we've, we've worked together with uh, from other groups to kind of build up a two-dimensional network. Uh, but I'll first plug the, the Autonomous um, Adaptive Low Power Instrument Platform just because it's something that I'm working on closely uh, with, with folks at Virginia Tech. Um, this is a, 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 a platform that's operated fully on solar and battery. Uh, it's as a result, it's low power, and we will mostly be focusing on the flux gate magnetometer and induction magnetometer measurements. So, when we operate on just solar and, and battery, um, there's a limitation that there's you know we, we have a power limitation. Basically, we can only operate up to 40 watts or so peak in the summer, and we have to um, go into hibernation. Or sorry, 20 watts uh, usually in the summer, and uh, lower power when we get towards the, the Antarctic winter. But the good news with these is that there's no moving parts, and um, that has helped us out to keep systems operating for a long time. And we're always, always, I'm always surprised to see that um, one of our systems is still working that's been out there for 15 years and with no maintenance or other visits. So we've just basically left that system out there, and it's come out of hibernation every year and collected data and returned data. Um, and so just imagine, you know, if you could do that with. Um, a satellite mission, you know, it's, it's hard to imagine having something that you don't monitor at all for 15 years and it keeps collecting data. So this has been pretty nice and we're, uh, we're hoping it keeps working for another 15 years if possible. 
Um, all the data are available on Themis and Speedass and CDAWeb uh, and also um, uh, Supermag. And so just a bit about um, why it's hard to put these systems out there and um, what kind of operational environment we're dealing with. Um, these are windy areas, they're high, high uh, so we bury our systems. They're um, at pressure altitudes of 3,000 to 4,000 meters, so they're really high up. You have extremes in temperature, sunlight, and weather. You can see that uh, from one day to the next when we were deploying one of these systems, we had a very big difference in the weather. Um, so this all leads to unique challenges for, for the instrument and deployment. And so when these systems were being built um, in University of Michigan, uh, way back in the, in the late 2000s and uh, early 2010s, they will use the design philosophy analogous to satellites uh, where, where size, weight, and power footprints were considered, and there was a lot of environmental testing. So I'd say these systems are probably more expensive than your average magnetometer system, but they uh, definitely uh, returned in, on investment because they're still still working many years later. Um, I wanted to plug also the fact that um, the systems were de designed in mind that you could remotely update the software. Uh, so they're using a single board computer, two-way iridium communication. And the, the remotely configurable software was a really huge, um, huge bonus for us or, or necessary thing to have because uh, multiple patches have had to be deployed over the years, including a critical one in 2020 that addressed a GPS rollover related fault. So graduate student at Virginia Tech, um, Shane Coyle deployed this, uh, designed and deployed this solution. He actually published a paper on it uh, in 2021 in the geoscience instrumentation methods. And you know, basically what happened was there was, uh, you know, we had deployed these systems so long ago that our GPS receiver um, or our Garmin GPS uh, on, on the site uh, was using a firmware that was not accounting for a rollover that happened in 2019. So the clock, it basically didn't know what the correct time was. And that bricked our systems basically. And, and Shane figured out a way to deploy a fix that got around that fault um, and basically recovered data from um, three sites that were completely out of communication. So again, it was really, really helpful to have that, that ability to remotely configure the software. Uh, and then the last thing I'll say is just that it's really hard. It, it took a long time to deploy these things because of all these challenges. We have to operate with twin auto aircraft. Um, and there's all kinds of things that increase in difficulty the further, further away you get from South Pole. So that means it took almost 10 years to deploy um, all the, the six original output platforms. And um, we know that these difficulties are only gonna continue in the coming years. Although we hope that there's more logistical resources available soon. I know um, our group and a bunch of other groups are struggling to, um, to, to get the resources to deploy new systems and to, to maintain the systems we already have. So all of this um, is kind of just a backdrop to say why we're motivated um, to work with international partners. And so the, the, um, I'll just talk really quickly about how we've been able to build up a two-dimensional network in Antarctica to work with our collaborators operating systems in the Northern Hemisphere to do two-dimensional uh, north-south hemisphere comparisons and sort of address that southern hemisphere observational gap I mentioned earlier uh, in reference to that Murray et al. paper. So we've, we always have worked with the uh, Technical University of Denmark. And in fact, their pre-existing network of magnetometers in Greenland, we, we, put, we deployed our systems in Antarctica to be at the IGRF uh, magnetic uh, conjugate point of several of the systems in Greenland. And so we have a nice 1D network along this meridian. And also we work with our collaborators at the New Jersey Institute of Technology who have two other um, AGO systems along this network. Uh, so there's, there's actually eight conjugate points uh, along this point, uh, this 1D network, where you can look at both hemispheres simultaneously. Um, we've recently uh, worked with the uh, Poor Research Institute of China um, who have a, a, a permanent station at Zhongshan, it's their main station. They also have several stations along this traverse that they do every year. And so we worked with them to build two new ALPIP uh, systems uh, that they recently deployed uh, just, just a couple months ago on their traverse um, between uh, Zhongshan and Taishan and Taishan and Kunlun. And uh, we're just starting to get data back from those, but um, I'll just mention that was a, that was a pretty Pretty epic challenge to, um, to 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 get those systems out there between um, trade wars and between uh, COVID and pandemic and stuff. So we started working with them, um, I think, almost five years ago, and finally they got deployed uh, a couple uh, a couple months ago. So we're excited to see what, what comes out of those systems. 
so, but, but anyway, with this, you'll have the ability to make uh, conjugate comparisons um, uh, across this uh, more longitudes than were available before. And do um, sort of Zhang chain is roughly conjugate to Svalbard. So it gives you a nice uh, conjugate point already. But then with these other systems, you'll be able to do uh, conjugate comparisons throughout this, this longitude uh, range of longitudes. OK, so then um, the British Antarctic Survey uh, has a network of uh, also a north-south network of magnetometers that roughly parallels uh, this this meridian. And um, what we've done is work with uh, British Antarctic Survey uh, with these these orange stars, uh, NGIT uh, again, who have uh, um, systems at South Pole as well as another AGO site over here, and uh, GFZ uh, who have the coastal base at Neumayer to to get a nice um, two-dimensional uh, uh, network along this. Um, range of longitudes sort of in this region of, of East Antarctica here. And so with this, you have closely spaced systems, both in latitude and longitude, and you can start to look, build up a two-dimensional picture of mesoscale current systems. And I'll show you some examples of that. And then finally, I'll just mention that we're working currently with the British Antarctic Survey to extend this network even further, to put two new um, conjugate uh, low power magnetometers that they operate um, all the way down to the end, basically have the, the, all these conjugate points covered down to NAQ, uh, down into your roll zone. And so all this, long story short, with all of this stuff is meant to, to get as much as we can out of um, data collected in Antarctica through international collaboration and collaboration also with our partners in the US to uh, do two-dimensional, uh, have the ability to do two-dimensional north south hemisphere comparisons. Okay, so now I'll get into some of the science. Um, most of the rest of the talk, I'll just give you some examples of some of the, the things you can do with these expanded networks of Antarctic measurements. So the, the next couple of slides, I'll be talking about some work looking at um, magnetic perturbation events, essentially <clears throat> events with large rapid deflections of magnetic field that are potentially important uh, for driving geomagnetically induced currents. So Mark Engerbretson uh, and colleagues have been leading several studies on this um, and they've been uh, using um, uh, data from both hemispheres, and they've seen in some recent work that there are timing and intensity differences. If you look at these magnetic perturbations in both hemispheres, uh, they're often more intense in the winter hemisphere and more intense on the night side. And, and they're currently investigating the source of these perturbations in the magnetosphere. Um, so what you're seeing here on these time series is just one example of one event. Um, this is basically um, data along one uh, along the longitude on this map, uh, sort of over here, South Pole and some of the British Antarctic Survey systems. Um, and you can see that there are definitely some large magnetic deflections, um, but they are very localized in latitude, uh, potentially. This is moving over to another longitude sector, uh, to where the PG sites are. Um, again, not that far away in longitude, maybe only 10 or 20 degrees. But you see that there are, um, you see there are also magnetic deflections here. But they're also, again, localized in, in latitude. And then these are northern hemisphere sites in Greenland that are roughly conjugate to the PG sites. And again, you see um, there are similarities, but there are also differences. And it's a, it's a bit um, challenging, I guess, to, to kind of visualize what's going on here um, with just time series. And so one of the nice things with having this closely spaced um, set of stations is that now you can do, um, uh, you can extract information about the ionosphere currents and show kind of two-dimensional images instead of just looking at time series. And so James Weigand has been leading an effort to generate um, spherical, use the spherical elementary currents technique to generate uh, maps of the ionosphere currents in both hemispheres. He's already had the technique to um, do this in the northern hemisphere, and he's recently used this, this small range of longitudes we have in Antarctica, where we have these closely space stations to get that, that kind of map, um, at least in this small range of latitudes in the southern hemisphere. And so with this kind of this kind of spacing between stations in Antarctica, you can actually look at um, things with spatial scales of a few hundred kilometers. And indeed, you can see in that event I just showed on the last slide that you have a very localized um, uh, field line, or sorry, very localized ionosphere current system that you can see uh, in both hemispheres. And I'm just going to zoom in because it's probably hard for people to see. Um, again, you can see that these deflections are localized to a very small range of latitudes. Um, and <clears throat> maybe only a few hundred kilometers. And that's consistent with what um, Mark Engerbretson was finding and, and colleagues were finding in the uh, Northern Hemisphere as well. You often see that these things are very localized in uh, both latitude and longitude. 
And so um, we're looking at a lot more of these maps now and doing some more um, north south hemisphere comparisons. For example, looking at how IMFBY affects the asymmetries. James Wigan is leading a study on that right now. Okay, so now another example uh, looking at waves. So um, this is an example looking at UOF waves, ultra low frequency waves with um, periods of a few minutes or uh, frequencies of a few, few millihertz. Um, these waves uh, have often been used as proxies for the open closed field line there, boundary and the aurora opal, depending on what local time sector you're in. And what uh, Shuling Shi did in a study in 2020 is she examined um, the north-south networks uh, in Antarctica and Greenland during a period with steady radial IMF condition. And in this particular case, found that they were not a reliable proxy uh, because you had a very um, spatially extended region of wave activity. So this is going from Thule, which is the, the northernmost tip of Greenland, down to NAQ, which is the southernmost tip, going from the polar cap to the Aurora zone. Um, and so you see waves spread throughout this whole region. They do have a broad peak, but there's not a, really an obvious um, location where they're they're peaking at. Uh, and um, I will say that this is an unusual event though, because I think there are many other examples where they do have a, a, a discrete peak in, in, um, in latitude and actually um, do seem to co-locate with the Aurora zone. So it's kind of an open question why this happens in some events and not others. And um, I'll just zoom in and say a few more words about but what uh, Shuling Shi found uh, in, this, in this case study. Um, basically, uh, MMS observations showed that, or suggested that iron force shock um, and solar wind seeded the growth of many above surface waves. Um, and the ground-based observations, you see that the waves have a very similar frequency with latitude. They do change their frequency a little bit, but they're, you know, we're only talking maybe within a, a one or two millihertz change from this huge range of latitudes. So I think the this event is seems to be very unusual. I mean, we don't usually see the waves with um, very similar properties, all extending all the way from the, the center of the Aurora zone deep into the polar cap. Usually you don't see, see this kind of wave activity uh, in the polar cap. And it's really weird also that this was, um, or strange that this is during solstice conditions when we expect an asymmetry in the ionosphere conductance, but um, you don't see an asymmetry in the wave amplitudes. They're roughly the same in the North and South hemisphere. So lots of strange things about this event. And we're looking for uh, trying to compare this kind of event with other events where you where you do see a localization of wave amplitude, and you do see, a, a, you know, very weak waves in the poor cap or no waves. You know, what's causing these differences between these different events? So, a very open area of research. Okay, I want to turn to some higher frequency um, observations now. Um, basically, the ground-based counterpart of electromagnetic ion cyclotron waves. So, there's um, a network of induction uh, magnetometers uh, that. Uh, Hillman Kim and colleagues have been uh, leading several studies on, uh, and Mark Engbretson as well, uh, and Sung Jun No. And what I'm showing you here is a result from Mark Engbretson, where you're seeing MMS um, magnetic field observations from, I believe, zero to, <clears throat> zero to one hertz, and then induction magnetometer observations in Antarctica at PG3, um, and roughly a conjugate point at Sonderstrom Fjord uh, in Northern Hemisphere, and then again, uh, Southern Hemisphere South Pole Station and PNG in the Northern Hemisphere roughly conjugate points. I think the bottom line from this figure uh, is that there's um, some similarities uh, from the satellite to the ground. You know, you see this big um, burst of high frequency waves as seen um, throughout uh, at all the sites, but with different and varying intensity and varying um, uh, frequency dependent structure. The earlier burst at MS is, isn't really seen at this site, but it's seen in some of the uh, Northern Hemisphere sites and maybe to a lesser extent South Pole. So this is just one example. I think the bottom line is that there are a number of ways the ionosphere and the spatial local localization in the magnetosphere affect what you observe on the ground. Uh, there's ducting in the ionosphere and there's, of course, um, again, localization in the magnetosphere. And so what, what uh, Hillman and Sungjun and Mark Ingebrigtsen are trying to do is figure out uh, kind of what's going on uh, between these different events at these different locations and understand how you can connect, you know, the, the, the ultimate goal of all this would be to under, to basically take observations in the ground and be able to figure out what's going on in the manusphere, where the EMIC waves are localized. This is another nice study recently submitted um, for, for publication by Sung Jun No at 
Uh, he's actually not at NJIT, he's at Los Alamos, but still working very closely with Hillman and colleagues at, at NJIT. And I think the nice thing here is that, again, he's taken a network of uh, induction magnetometers, both in the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere, and shown that there's some pronounced differences in the um, frequency dependent structure you see uh, for a given EMIC wave event in the magnetosphere. What you see on the ground is very different from location to location. And um, in this particular event, he's looking at ion force shock disturbances and how they're uh, driving these different wave properties. So again, it's getting into, um, you have the ion force shock, which is already introducing um, north, south, and east, west asymmetries in terms of where you might see the EMIC waves excited in the magnetosphere. And then you have the ionosphere, which is processing and inducting that energy coming in from the EMIC waves and then creating uh, spatial differences in wave power and, and, and uh, uh, frequencies uh, at different locations. So the nice thing is that with this larger and larger networks of observations uh, in the ground, combined with satellite observations, we can try to figure out uh, what's, what's driving uh, this, this, um, th these differences in, in wave power and frequency at uh, different locations. Okay, so those are some examples of how we can um, use north-south hemisphere comparisons to get information about mesoscale current systems. Um, the last couple of slides, I just wanna show you some examples of how we can use, also use north-south hemisphere comparisons to do natural experiments to understand what factors are playing into what you observe in terms of the ground magnetic disturbance. Um, just one example of this, uh, this is an equation of how you relate the magnetic disturbance just above the ionosphere to the magnetic disturbance on the ground or the surface for, for just one particular phenomena, uh, standing alphane waves. And for very simplified assumptions of uniform um, Hall, ionosphere call and Pedersen conductance and uniform ground conductivity and, and so on, and, and you know, harmonic varying wave structure. For, even with all these assumptions, you can see that the ionosphere conductance is, is factoring into what you see on the ground. The uh, K, which is related to the, the properties of the wave, the wave vector, and its relationship with the scale height, or the, the basically the spatial extent of the ionosphere vertically, that's those two have an, have an interplay there. And then the ground conductivity plays a role. We usually assume this is one, but it's not, I'm sorry, zero, but it's not. Um, most of the time you do have a contribution from ground induced currents. So all of these things play into what you see on the ground. And so what we can do is try to pick conditions where we have, um, contrasts in these quantities between the North and the South hemisphere and use them to, to kind of isolate one or another of these parameters. For example, with regard to the ground conductivity, we always have an asymmetry between Greenland where we have a land sea interface um, and Antarctica where it's basically a, a, a uniform ice cap. And there's also depth, depth dependent variations as well, but you can do basically conjugate experiments to figure out um, what's going on in terms of the ground conducti con conductivity contrast in Greenland to Antarctica. You can also you know, look at solstice versus equinox or northern winter versus northern summer and try to tease out what's going on in the ionosphere. So the last couple of slides, I'll just show some examples of how we look at these different factors, both in terms of the external driver, the ionosphere and the ground. So this is, um, I think, a fairly uh, intuitive example where we looked at uh, interplanetary shocks, which are striking the magnetosphere at different angles. So first, I just want to give you a, a quick uh, overview of what you might expect for this, the case where an interplanetary shock strikes the Earth's magnetosphere symmetrically. So there's a long history of observations of this, and Araki et al. put together a nice summary of what you would ex generally expect for the magnetic disturbance related to um, an interplanetary shock. Uh, depending on your, your longitude, you'll, you'll get basically a, um, a north and then a south or a south and a north deflection in the magnetic disturbance, but you basically get this, this um, positive and the negative disturbance in general, uh, or negative and then positive. Uh, and this is true for, you know, again, large scale pressure disturbances like from the solar wind from an interplanetary shock. Um, so keep this structure in mind uh, as I move forward in the next two slides. Um, so uh, Denny Oliveira uh, has been leading many studies looking at um, how the shock impact angle affects a variety of different um, many sphere on sphere uh, phenomena. Um, this kind of started with this all and radar 2014 study where they simulated how uh, the magnetic disturbance related to an inclined shock uh, differs from that related to a frontal shock or symmetric shock. What you're seeing here 
uh, sorry for the labels being cut off, but this is basically the, the you can think of this like uh, SM or dipole Z axis and X axis, like the Earth's sun line. So this shock in this case is coming in and striking the Northern hemisphere first. Whereas in this case, um, again, Z is the, the Y axis, the shock is striking symmetrically. And you can immediately see that the magnetic disturbance is, is different. I mean, the sign is different between the North and the South here, whereas you see a symmetric disturbance. So very intuitive. I mean, like if you have something striking asymmetrically, you're gonna get asymmetries in the system. But I think what's striking is, is just how large an asymmetry this can create in the ground magnetic disturbance, particularly at high latitudes. So this is from uh, Shu et al 2020 space weather article showing um, the north south hemisphere comparisons along that, that meridian where we have the nice Greenland network as well as the southern hemisphere network. And the first thing I'll call your attention to, this is each, each trace here is from a different station in Greenland in black. Um, this is again, the polar cap to the auroral zone. First thing to call your attention to is you really don't see a nice clean um, north south disturbance like I showed here. It's really more of a step-like disturbance. So that's already a difference. There is um, definitely not a very similar structure between the Southern hemisphere, which is the red lines and their conjugate point in the North um, in the black lines, they look very different. Um, so again, not uh, unusual, you know, so basically the shock is striking the Northern hemisphere first and it's creating a more intense response and also something that doesn't really look a whole lot like the classical picture. Uh, this is a case where uh, Zhang Washu has picked out a frontal shock or a symmetric shock, and you see something a lot closer to the, the Iraqi picture, that nice south and then northward response that you would expect at, in the dusk sector, and also very similar uh, observations between the north and, and south hemispheres, at the contrary points. So a very nice contrast between um, these two events, and I think it just is, is another line of evidence along with several studies that um, I should mention Denny Oliveira was a collaborator in this, and this is another example of, I think, why we, you know, in, the, in the papers that he's been leading, why we need to take account of the shock impact angle, because it really does create a very large asymmetry in, in the ground magnetic disturbance as well as in other, other things throughout the magnetosphere and atmosphere system. Okay, this is another example um, looking at um, uh, ionospheric conductance contrasts. Um, I don't know if this movie is going to play. Okay, yeah. So basically, um, in December 4th, 2021, there was an Antarctic eclipse. This is an example of a very rare event. Um, we, we've only had, uh, I think the last Antarctic eclipse was about 20 years ago. And in general, eclipses in polar regions are more rare than the eclipses you'll get um, closer to the equator. But the nice thing with polar eclipses is you can test um, how contrasts uh, in ionosphere conductance related to the eclipse affect um, you know, local many astronomers or current systems, mesoscale current systems, as well as global effects. And so what Shane Coyle uh, did in this study published recently in JGR was show that um, the time of peak obscuration at each site, which is different by site, as you can see these dots um, uh, are indicating, uh, kind of lined up with an increase in pulsation activity or UF wave activity. And this is something that other studies have shown. I mean, when we looked into the literature of the connection uh, between eclipses and ULF waves. There were some studies basically saying that, that you can have an uptick in ULF wave activity. And we, we, we seem to be finding that in this event. Um, there was another interesting thing with this event, which is that a substorm occurred really close to the time when this eclipse was happening. And uh, Shane is, has been exploring connections between that and, and um, basically how this, this big change in the ionosphere, we see it also, and he reports this also in the change in the total electron content that we see how this change in that, that ionosphere conductance affects the global dynamics, for example, related to the substorm, as well as the local dynamics related to these pulsations. And this is just one example of um, ways we've been experimenting uh, using natural experiments related to ionosphere conductance. We've also looked at non-eclipse conditions and, and myself and also Slava Pelpenko and others have looked at, at this in a couple of different ways. Um, but in the interest of time, we'll just briefly move on or quickly go, on th go through, <laughs> through the last topic here. Um, so we've just started working on the contrast and ground con conductivity, um, in particular, how ground induced uh, currents can, can contribute to surface magnetic field measurements. And as I mentioned earlier, we have that nice contrast between the west coast of Greenland and East Antarctica. Um, and if people are interested, I can show you some examples a little later, but uh, basically it's, it's, a, it's definitely a work in progress and we're, um, uh, we're looking at that right now. 
So I'm just going to summarize this part, and then I'll show a few last slides on the, the wider ground-based uh, ground magnetometer communities efforts. Um, just the summary, I mean, uh, we're using 1D and 2D expanded networks of Antarctica uh, magnetometers and other instruments. Uh, we're, we're making these networks through uh, autonomous in instrumentation as well as collaboration, both internationally and also with our US partners, uh, NGIT uh, and others. Um, we can use this uh, to remote sense mesoscale current systems, do 1D and 2D interest hemisphere comparisons and do natural experiments. And you can get the data on Themis, CDLab, and Supermag. And so with the last couple of slides, I'll just mention briefly how this kind of fits in. This kind of effort fits into wider community efforts. Uh, so as Kyle mentioned at the beginning, I'm involved in the US uh, Ground Magnetometer Board, which was a group formed in 2016 uh, by Mark Engerbretz and FDU Zesta. And it's a community-driven effort. You can read more about it. Um, if you look on the GEM Wiki page for uh, US Ground Magnetometer, you can find it. Also, Engerbretson and Zesta 2017 Space Weather article. But I'll just, I'll just read this quote from this article to give you a sense of the context about why we started this group. So previous and current practices regarding ground magnetometer deployments in the US have led to a culture of individual arrays having to support both operations and scientific efforts using limited resources. Each team develops their own data recording systems, software analysis, and even data formats. The result of it has been much duplication of effort and only limited updating of instrumentation and innovation and data products. So one of the main goals of our board is to coordinate activities across uh, magnetometer network operators and data users supported by US funding agencies. I just wanna pause and, and just say quickly, because I think um, a lot of times when I give this kind of information or talk about this kind of information, people get confused between the relationship between SuperMag, which I think a lot of you probably are familiar with, and the magnetometer network operators. So SuperMag um, takes magnetometer data from magnetometer operators, both in the US and internationally and, and uses it to put it in a common data format and make um, higher level data products. It's super useful for the community, but SuperMag is not the operator of those magnetometers. So a lot of us, including the Antarctic magnetometer networks I just mentioned, um, many other networks operate both in the United States and internationally from, from US funding sources. We're all taking grants from different programs within the National Science Foundation. These grants are sometimes very small. There may be a, a few hundred K over a couple of years Depends on the project, depends on the scope of the project. But um, this is this is where this quote comes from. Is basically that when you have, you know, when you have, a, for example, an incoherent scatter radar with, you know, a 10, 20 million dollar budget, you can hire full time engineers to, to work on that. But when you have a magnetometer network with a few hundred k budget, you have to really struggle to scrape together funds to fund an engineer. So that's that's what we're trying to to try to help with with this kind of these kinds of discussions. How can we get efficiencies? and move towards something more like a facility model for ground-based magnetometers. So the decadal survey is a big part of what our group has been involved in recently. We've been, we were, over the last couple of years, we worked on white papers that we just submitted to the decadal survey last year. Um, if you're interested, I can send you the white paper we, we worked on for the board, um, but you can also, they should be published pretty soon if they aren't already. And you can, and I also, if anyone's interested in, in um, working with ground-based magnetometer data, or proposing to, to, to use or, or deploy magnetometers, I highly recommend checking out the wiki page for US, US ground-based magnetometer arrays. Um, there's lots of notes and presentations on there that might help you um, get a sense of what's going on curr currently in, in US supported ground-based magnetometer research and some ideas for future projects. And the last, this is my last slide. I just wanted to mention some recommendations from our group's overarching white paper that we submitted to the Decadal Survey. Um, we really emphasize the strategic shift to proactively identify operational efficiencies, kind of see if there are data gaps coming on the horizon, if a, if a network is going to lose funding or, or is having difficulties operating, and try to address them and, and work with the funding agencies to address them. Um, continue support for individual magnetometer networks and really emphasize um, you know, multi-instrument platforms and training and retaining magnetometer experts and trying to move towards a facility model uh, as much as we can getting away from the model of having very small projects. Um, I mean, there still will be a balance of small projects and the, the facility, I think, but finding more of a balance, I think, where we can, can share resources is something that we really want to prioritize. And yeah, just consider attending our GEM workshop and joining our Google group. And with that, I will uh, leave it and, and thank you and take questions. Thanks, Mike, for a great talk and a great update.
Uh, we do have a couple questions. Uh, we have two similar ones and then one regarding the uh, ionospheric conductivity. Um, so our first question comes from uh, John Hadusik. Uh, you say it's rare to see the same current system in both hemispheres. Is that mainly because of not having instruments in the right location in both hemisphere, hemispheres? Or are there also cases where the current systems might only reach one hemisphere? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I think it's a great point that since we don't have um, the, let's see if I can find them. Yeah, let's go to this one. Yeah, since we don't have uh, great coverage in the Southern hemisphere, um, it's hard to actually answer that question, right? Because we don't, you know, what I, we can deploy and we have deployed systems at the IGRF conjugate point of um, two sites. But of course, as we all know, the Earth's magnetic field isn't, doesn't behave like IGRF. I mean, there's distortions from solar wind driving. And then, so even though you think you're at the same, if you just use the Earth's internally generated magnetic field to, to, to put two systems uh, at either end of a field line, they're not necessarily at either end of a field line when there's a finite IMFBY and all, all other things that can distort current systems. So what you really need is to, to answer this question fully is a really a two-dimensional network where you always have observations in both hemispheres on a grid. And you can actually say there, here is the counterpart of something I'm observing in the Northern hemisphere in the South. And then you can answer this question that you're raising, which is, is it cases where a system is only reaching one hemisphere or is it cases where we have um, the current system in both hemispheres, but it's just shifted away in longitude from where we would expect it the, or, or in latitude because of something going on in the solar wind or magnetosphere? So it's a great question. I think there is probably there are cases, I think, where the, the currents don't close in both hemispheres. Um, and there's some modeling work that's been done on that. Um, but and also I should I should plug that you know, ground-based magnetometers aren't the only thing you can look at. We have super darn. So if you're looking at larger scale current systems um, and convect and um, flows related to larger scale uh, things going on in the menu sphere, you can use something like super darn to build up a picture of, of you know whether there actually are asymmetries and and you know not have these data gaps. But I think the short answer to your question is probably yes. There are cases where the current system isn't reaching both hemispheres, and um, but we don't have a, a good sense of that answering that question. Um, at least not from the data, and we won't until we have good coverage, I think, two-dimensionally. Although it will, it will depend on the current system we're talking about. I think some current systems we, we understand more than others. Excellent, thanks. Uh, so Jason has a second question, but I think you've answered it, um, but I'll read it out any, either way. Um, how, when taking images at conjugate points, do you know whether you're looking at a field line field line event which has different behavior in the northern and southern hemispheres as opposed to an event on a different field line because of some deviation in the assumed mapping. Yeah, it, the, yeah, and that is it's definitely related. And I'll just say again that um, we need multiple, I mean, in, in the context of ground-based magnetometers, we really need two-dimensional networks. I think this is something that comes up all the time you know, first we had the struggle where we had only like one or two systems and you you had to really, really um, make some assumptions about this. And yeah, yeah, you couldn't you couldn't address that possibility that you're raising, that there's some deviation from the field line mapping. Like in this case, you know, you might have the mesoscale current system mapping to this longitude and, and latitude in the, in the northern hemisphere, but in the south, it map, might map over here. So if you have the, the two IGRF conjugates, you'll see different things and you, you won't know, you know, why is that? It's, it's just shifted over. So when you have this two-dimensional network, you can really address that, that question. And also bring in, I, I would also say, you know, moving outside the context of ground-based magnetometers, you can also bring in other data sources. So, you know, it would be amazing if we had um, satellite-based imagers kind of looking at both um, uh, poles simultaneously, because then you can really get at some of these questions um, for certain phenomena and, and just other data sources as well. SuperDARN is another great example where you can look at two-dimensional coverage. So bringing in multiple data sets and getting two-dimensional coverage is really, really crucial. And I, and yeah, you're right. There are definitely cases where things are shifted and, and we're not actually at the conjugate point. Definitely. So as a follow-up, um, roughly what size of a spatial region is it reasonable to assume uniform conductance? Has that been yeah. very much? That's a great question. Um, I think it, it it's going to depend on 
you know, what latitude and longitude you're at, uh, and, and, and along with other factors. I think on the night side, um, the uh, you, the con conductance, especially in the rural zone, is going to be highly non-uniform. I don't know if I have a figure that can really make this point. Let me see. Yeah, it's not shown here very well. But yeah, when you have when you're on the night side, and the ambient conductance is low um, from because there's there's no sunlight. When you have um, you know when you look at moving from outside the aural zone to inside the aural zone, you have a really sharp change in conductance because you don't have that background conductance from photoionization. Uh, if you're on the day side um, where there is photoionization happening, you have, you know, in the summer hemisphere, you might have not as huge, you know, you can almost treat the ionosphere conductance as more likely to be uniform because even though there is precipitation happening, you know, the, the ionosphere conductance isn't changing as much with latitude, but in the winter hemisphere, it is still changing quite a bit with latitude. So I think the short answer to your question is it really depends on what latitude and longitude you're at. Um, but I do, I will say that there are cases where the conductance is changing rapidly. You know, you have to also, you have to also consider when you're asking, you know, how uniform is it, you have to compare with the thing that you're studying. So for a large scale current system, um, you might not care as much about little, little, little blips in the ionosphere conductance, but if you have a mesoscale current system or a ULF wave, um, you have to compare, for example, the, the wave vector with the, um, the spatial scale in the um, in the ionosphere, and there's some work by um, Carlines Glassmeyer and Yerker and Southwood and, and a few others looking for some some ideal cases like how big is that gradient? How big can a gradient can you have um, for a certain wavelength uh, for you to consider it a small gradient or a large gradient? So yeah, I don't have a good answer for you, but I think it definitely depends on latitude and longitude, and it definitely depends on what um, phenomena you're studying. Uh, mesoscale current systems. Um, will care a lot more about uh, strong uh, local gradients. Cool. And I have one final question, which is kind of along the same lines. Um, have you guys seen any evidence for the quarter mode ULF wave field line resonances with uh, conjugate studies? Um, I think, yes, we have. We haven't looked carefully at that yet. Um, but it's an interesting question because a lot of the observations of the quarter wave mode from um, ground-based magnetometer observations are coming more from low and mid latitudes. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's a nice uh, setup for us to look at that uh, in, in um, higher latitudes uh, and see, see if we can see these things. So I think we've seen some evidence of this, but I, honestly, we, I don't think we've pursued it very careful yet. So it's a great suggestion and we should definitely look at that. And anyone can look at it too. Like we have our data again are on C.web and, and Themis and and yeah, if you're interested, uh, we're happy to work with people to look for that. But yeah, we, we, we are looking into it and we're interested in that. Ah, cool, excellent. Well, thank you again, Mike, for the wonderful talk. Um, uh, next week, we have Hong Zhao and Ben Hogan and they're going to be discussing the uh, GEM focus group understanding of radiation belt particle dynamics through multi spacecraft and ground based observations. Uh, so, with that, I hope everyone has a wonderful week and thank you again, Mike, for a great talk. Thanks for